wrap up now with John, and we're going to be done for tonight. How are we doing so far? Good? Okay. So now I'm going to take the synoptics and I'm going to squish them together. I'm going to talk about what they have in common as if they're a single unit because John is just so different. So the synoptics, they teach with proverbs and often speak in parables. Now a proverb is metered, it's brief, it's easy to remember, and it lingers in the mind. Okay? When Jesus referred to himself as the son of man, there was kind of a double meaning there because uh, there is both son of man as Ezekiel is often referred to. God says to you, you know, son of man, go do this. Son of man, tell them this. Son of man, this is how it's going to be. And then there's a passage in Daniel where we've got, uh, you know, it's Daniel 7, 13 to 14. Um, like when Jesus, when, when God at the burning bush says, I am. When God revealed himself to Moses and his revelation actually just showed a greater mystery. So what is God's name? God's name is I am. He told us something, yet at the same time us being told just created a deeper mystery. And when our hearts are turned to him properly, it makes us hungry to know more. So when he spoke in Proverbs and when he spoke in parables, now a parable is designed to obscure while revealing. So Proverbs and parables mix in the way Jesus teaches in the synoptics because Seeing, they do not see. Hearing, they do not hear and understand because these people's hearts have become calloused. Um, they do not see with their eyes. They do not hear with their ears or else they would turn and I would heal them. The idea is Jesus and the synoptics in particular, we, they, have, they capture the way he taught that if your heart is pointed at him the right way, when he says something you don't understand, you want to know more. Whereas when your heart is turned the wrong way, and you don't like him or what he's about, and he says something, you're then able to dismiss him. I told you this guy was a lunatic. Oh, this guy is possessed. You know, this guy, why do we even listen to him? And so the exact same statement revealed the hearts of the people talking. Proverbs and parables are very heavy in the synoptics. He teaches on the kingdom of God, which has a tension between it opening and breaking into our lives now and being completely fulfilled when he comes back. Uh, he taught on his effect on the law of Moses. Uh, people around him had degrees of incomprehension and were slowly coming to understand. We had uh, the greatest commandment and love your neighbors, love your enemies. And let me start showing you. Let's talk about John for a second because I could keep going. You, we just covered this, so let's talk about it in contrast. So 9-11. The more the synoptics are written closer to 9-11, basically, this event that from the point of view of the people then affected everything. But 2,000 years later, 2,000 years from now, I don't know if people will remember 9-11, but if the Lord tarries, they will remember Christ. And they will remember the crucifixion and the resurrection. So we had this seismic shift that has rippled out in time, and the people who were at the center, it affected their ability to understand one way. John, very likely it looks like here, it says here, the fourth was like an eagle in flight. So if you look at these animals, Okay, if you've got the lion here, the ox, and the man kneeling, you'll notice all three of them are on the ground. The eagle, however, is specifically in flight. And if you look at the diagram, all of these are hard little shapes with straight lines, right? But we have a sphere orbiting the others. John is a very different animal than the synoptics. So, whereas the synoptics taught with Proverbs and, oft, and he often spoke in parables, in John, we have these long conversations punctuated by questions or objections. Let me take a chapter that you guys are going to be familiar with. And maybe I'll use this instead of the, well, we'll see. So, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We all know this passage, right? And most of us even know it comes from John 3.16. John 3 is when Nicodemus approaches Jesus at night which I'll get into why at night matters, and asks him some questions. And Jesus gives some responses. And then Nicodemus replies again. And there's a little bit of a back and forth. And then eventually, it breaks down so that, if you look at the very last item under the, the bottom right of the box, scenes lead to dialogue which dissolve into monologue. The reason this matters, so Nicodemus approaches Jesus at night. 
we see that you must be a teacher sent from God because of the things you do. Jesus says you must be born again. Well, how can this be? You're Israel's teacher and you don't know this? Well, this is how, you know, like how the wind blows or whatever. And then you get about 10 verses in or 20 verses in and you don't see Nicodemus again. It doesn't say Nicodemus went, thank you, Jesus. I really appreciated that. Or, wow, I still don't get it. I'm going to have to think about this. No, Nicodemus just drops out of the story because the way that John often sets up his stories is he starts us with, you know, the man at the pool of Bethesda who's crippled and gets healed. And then there's a whole controversy going on all in chapter five about that. Or you have the woman at the well and they have their conversation and that leads to an extended dialogue and then a monologue the same way. Not chapter nine, the man who was born blind. Jesus heals his man born blind. And all of a sudden, man, you know, the Jewish authorities just are having a field day. They're having a fit over this thing. And that's one of the reasons why John stands out. One, there's quite a bit of repetition. Two, there's only seven miracles, seven signs, things like water into wine, healing with a word, man born blind, and so on. And then there's seven I am statements. I am, you know, the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. You know, I am the bread that came from heaven. So in the same way that 66 books is not as easy to remember as four, you know, 66 things is harder to remember than four. 59 miracles, I think, are recorded in the Gospels, and yet John only bothers to record seven. Another reason we tend to like John is John uses simpler language. He keeps it to seven miracles. He keeps it to seven I am statements. And not only that, he, um, he sets a scene, and then he lets everybody argue until eventually Jesus starts talking and everybody else just kind of fades out. And we're left with Jesus' words and what John has to say about Jesus' words. So second item here under synoptics, bottom of the sheet. So he teaches on the kingdom of God, the effect of the law on Moses in the synoptics. In John, he teaches on the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if we're met in the synoptics with degrees of incomprehension and perhaps some people coming to understand, a lot of times in John, we have flat out misunderstanding or even people... Uh, you know, combined with irony. So things are just taken out of context, completely misunderstood. We have the greatest commandment and love your neighbor in the synoptics. Jesus says, this final command I give you, love your neighbors. In the synoptics, crucifixion is a burden endured for a greater cause. In John, crucifixion is a final exaltation unless the Son of Man is lifted up, which leads to salvation. Whereas we have entering the kingdom of God, a, a kind of a tension between it breaking and now and being fulfilled later in Christ. In John, enter eternal life. When you believe in the Son, you will enter into eternal life. That's the way John talks. It's a very immediate, sudden thing. Um, Jesus makes many statements about himself and verifies them with miracles. But in John, we have seven I am statements and seven signs with a lot of symbolism. You know, it is the day when we can work. The night is soon coming when nobody will be able to work. You know, when he meets the Samaritan woman in chapter four, it is noon, the brightest part of the day. And the only time in all four gospels I can think of when someone says, are you the Christ? That he goes, yes, I am. She says, well, I know that when the Messiah comes and he goes, the person talking to you is him. That's like the only time I've been able to find where he's just like, yes, not you say I am or they say I'm saying, you know, no, yes, it was noon. It was the time of fullest revelation. And yet when Nicodemus goes and he's all confused and he's asking questions and Jesus is just shooting back that he doesn't understand it's night. This kind of thing shows up in John. Um, and then the last thing enemies include Let's see, enemies include scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, chief priests, high priests, a lot of people to keep track of in the synoptics. But in uh, John, the enemies are mostly the Jewish authorities. I really like the Good News translation of that. And so as far as John goes, I'll close with this. This is uh, also put out by the Visual Bible. It is also word for word. I really enjoy it. It's the entire Gospel of John. Uh, broken up into chapters, but it's a movie. If I put this on, you wouldn't even know that it's word for word. You know, they're using that as a script. So that is basically the Gospels in a nutshell. So let me close this out. Let us catch our breath by taking a look at John 4, 43 through 45, the last skinny little column. After the two days, he departed for Galilee. And then we just get a, a, a parenthesis here. That is all the acknowledgement John gives us of the, of the event. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown.
That's it. And then he says, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone. So the same family that rejected him and saw the miracles he did at the feast, now we have some context we didn't have until right now. That when he went to his hometown, it was after the feast. And that the people who were sitting there looking at him, saying, who does he think he is, saw him perform miracles. And then John not only adds that context, he says, but the Galileans, and in this context, it means the Gentile Galileans, accepted and embraced him, whereas the, uh, his, not just the Jewish people, but his own cousins, his own aunts, and his own uncles were the ones that pushed him aside. So raise your hand if you... Uh, if you learned something about Jesus being rejected in his hometown, you may not have known before you came in tonight. Yeah. And so let me close this out by saying, um, I don't care how good your memory is. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care if you could memorize every word of this in Greek, there would still be more to learn tomorrow. And I don't care if you've never cracked these open. I don't care if it feels like maybe this is something you couldn't get. You can learn something more today about the Gospels, something more about Christ as revealed in the Gospels than you knew yesterday. And there are tools for making that happen. And I can show you a couple. You've seen these two movies. So let's say you're not a book person. Well, you can watch these on YouTube even. If you type in Visual Bible John, there it is. Visual Bible Matthew, there it is. You know... I really like this. It's put together by people way smarter than me. The reason I say they're way smarter is they can actually simplify it to a level I'm still trying to learn how to do. But this uh, Complete Idiot's Guide to the Bible, I'm learning stuff in here, and yet it's broken down so simple and so basic. I can look through any page in here and be like, yeah, I get it. Okay, that makes sense. I think I got this. Um, message translation is uh, everyday language, the way people talk nowadays excellent translation for, especially for Old Testament, but for any of it. Life Recovery Bible, really good notes in here for how to live our lives and apply this stuff in practical ways. Some of the best work I've seen. Um, and it's got some connection to 12-step to groups and things like that, which is basically about people trying to live better and to get away from that trap door in the hourglass where we lose the sand that has bothered to pour all the way down from the head through the heart into our lives and then we go do things we shouldn't do and it wrecks our lives. This book really helps show us the parts of the Bible to help us close that trap door so that transformation can last. Um, I already went over this. Chronological, 365 readings, narrated. Why this part of the book matters. And it squishes the Gospels together so Instead of having had to read four columns, you'd have just read half a page. It's kind of cool. And then this is just, a, in my opinion, a really good study Bible. It's the Nelson Study Bible in New King James. I've seen some NIV Study Bibles and some ESV Study Bibles, and I'm very happy with those as well. <sighs> okay, guys. I uh, apologize that I went about six minutes over, but uh, I hope it was worth it.